Hi everyone, welcome to today's LACNIS webinar. It's a marathon, not a sprint with Dr. Eric Lu. I'm Lindsay Judavine, the Director of Communications for LACNITS, and this is... I'm Lisa Yen. I'm the Program Director for LACNITS. Before we get started, I'd like to take a second to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's live webinar possible. You're the best, Rich. Here are a few tech tips for today's webinar. For audio, be sure the volume on your computer is turned all the way up. Also, double check that the volume is unmuted on the webinar broadcast screen. For your video, you can enlarge the webinar broadcast screen by clicking the expand screen button in the bottom right corner. Also, the full webinar will be posted shortly after on our LACNITS YouTube channel. Our channel consists of a video library of 100 plus net videos. They feature presentations on a wide range of net topics not covered in today's webinar, including lug nets, high grade nets, immunotherapy, PRT, alpha PRT, clinical trials, caregiving and coping, and much more. Also, be sure you're following LACNETS on social media to stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at LACNETS. Before I pass it off to Lisa, as a reminder, these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNITS. And now I'll pass it off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. LACNITS is a program by Generate Possibility, a registered nonprofit and stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this rare disease that used to be known as carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. The more accurate term is neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer since we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are in fact led by a team, which includes our interim administrator and board member, Kavya Velagaputi, board member, Donna Gavin, who's also the sister of LACNIT's founder and executive director emeritus, Giovanna Joyce and Basie. Our board also includes Mary Dunleavy, who is living and thriving with NET. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eric Liu, who is well known to many. An internationally recognized surgeon, Dr. Liu specializes in neuroendocrine tumors. He completed a fellowship at Uppsala University in Sweden under Dr. Obert considered one of the pioneers of neuroendocrine research and was responsible for establishing the first clinical trial in the United States for the Gallium 68 PET CT scan, an important tool in diagnosing patients with NET. Dr. Liu was previously at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he established a neuroendocrine center. He and Dr. Alan Cohn head up the Neuroendocrine Tumor Center in Denver based out of Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. Dr. Liu likes to say that his focus is always to treat the patient, not just the disease. He finds that giving patient time and respect is critical to developing a sense of trust because it is a team effort with the patient in the center. He always tells people that he values the quality of life as highly as the quantity of life. So now I'm excited to introduce Dr. Eric Liu. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that nice introduction, Lisa. You know, she very much captured how I feel about taking care of neuroendocrine patients. And hopefully, uh, with uh, many of, the, of you on the audience, we'll be able to talk. Um, so last month, there was a, LACNIS had a big conference about neuroendocrine, and I'm sure they presented lots of slides and data and treatment options and medicines and things. So. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, cer certainly go back to, to the, the um, video conference library that Lindsay just talked about. 
But uh, I want to just talk a little bit today just about a little bit of philosophy and kind of how to approach it as a, as a patient. Because I've seen this now for many, many years, and I've seen, you know, it feels like every different kind of neuroendocrine, although I am surprised every day. And what I found is that the understanding and the way we think about neuroendocrine is very, very different from other types of cancers or even other kinds of diseases. And so I was hoping that I could share some of my thoughts uh, with about neuroendocrine with you all so that it maybe helps to kind of change the way that you, that you approach it and think about it and think about what's really important. Um, that's really my goal. And of course, afterwards, we'll have a, hopefully a really great Q&A of which, you know, everyone is welcome to, to participate. So that'll be really terrific. Yeah, so please log in for that. Um, but my topic, and it's just a topic, is neuroendocrine tumors. I, it's a marathon, not a race. And that's really what I want to stress. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. Um, we have uh, our little friend up there, which is mostly for neuroendocrine. And then we have our little guy down there, which is maybe how people make you think about your disease. And that's where we want to think, change the philosophy and reframe you because maybe it will give you a sense of how to control the way you think about your disease. Okay. So as Lisa said, I work here in Denver, Colorado. I work at uh, the Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. It's a private practice here. I work at a hospital. And if anyone wants to come see me, this is my clinic. It's uh, not easy to get to, but you're all more than welcome to come. Luckily, you can fly to a big airport called Denver International. This is a patient of mine. His name is James B. You can see, checking out my little clinic up here. And uh, he even brings his own Sandistatin. So you can see he's well prepared. I'm totally kidding. It's uh, the sky is blue outside and there's not a drop of snow. So, <laughs> But anyone who needs help is always welcome to come up to Denver. I just like that video because it reminds me of sometimes how the weather is here in Colorado. But so here we are, just so you know, as, as Lisa said, I trained um, in Europe. So here's Denver, which I didn't really realize was a very Mediterranean kind of latitude. And so when I first started, I went to Uppsala, Sweden, which had the best clinic in the whole wide world back then. And then that's the same latitude as Uranium City. So <laughs> I thought it was just really interesting to see where they sent me to get all my training. But it was fantastic. If, no, if, if you've never been to Sweden or Scandinavia, you really should. It's really, really neat. Uh, it's brutal in the winter, so don't go in the wintertime. But if you go in the summer, it's very beautiful. I mean, they have buildings there that have been standing for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I think this is the oldest cathedral in all of um, Scandinavia, I think. So uh, it was quite beautiful. But I was very blessed to work with a lot of really great people when I was just getting started and learning. And so we did surgery together. And I spent time with uh, this gentleman here. His name is Dr. Oberg. He was really kind of the grandfather of neuroendocrine. And so I learned a lot from their clinic. And I was very, very blessed. And so I've been doing it for the past 10 years. And hopefully, you know, I've in the past 10 years, things have changed. And I've, I've gotten better. And hopefully, I've you know even grown out of what I've learned from Uppsala. So that's kind of where I come from, and I just want to give you a little bit of background so you know who I am. But let me explain a little bit about what we're going to do today. So this is not, hopefully not like a lecture. This is about time and that we talk together. So what I'm not going to do for you is I'm not going to dazzle you with data in a bunch of charts. I'm not going to tell you about all the treatment options and all the problems and all the good things they can do. I'm not going to go over all the deep genetics and molecular aspects of neuroendocrine tumors because my goal is I don't want to confuse you. Okay, that's not what I'm trying to do today. I'm hopefully we can have a conversation and that's really what I want. Because I'm hoping what I can do for you is to think about really it is what is it we're trying to achieve. And I say that in a very vague way because I'm not always sure your healthcare provider knows what that means. So I want it to be clear to you what that means. And as Lisa kind of told you, this is what I think about. How can you heal, right? How can you feel better? How can your body be stronger? And then how can you live right? Because that's the whole goal. If I told you you didn't have this disease and you know we, you were just going to go about your life, that's exactly what you want. Well, what if I told you you had this disease? 
and you could still live the life you want, right? And so that's what we're trying to accomplish today. So those are the things I want you to think about a little bit, and maybe we can talk about it in the, in the session afterwards. Okay, so here's, here's my goal. I have one purpose, right? So when you first started this, you probably felt like the little zebra with the deer in the headlights and the big eyes because you're like, oh my gosh, I have cancer. What does that mean? What's going on? Well, probably as you've seen doctor after doctor and you know treatment after treatment, things start to change a little bit. You start to reframe a little bit. All of a sudden, your eyes start to focus a little bit more. You kind of figure out what's going on. And then it becomes more real. Like every day, it becomes a little bit more realistic, more realistic. And so that's really what we're trying to get to you, right? So this is almost a real thing. This is almost real life. And then finally, we reframe it in such a way that you are dealing with what's real. You do know what's going on. And you, you, the way you think about it is the appropriate way to think about it. So I want you to re hopefully reframe the way you think about neuroendocrine and how you can live and live well with your disease. Okay, so again, when I reframe, the question for you is how do I, not me, but how do you initially not die from this disease, right? I'm sure there are people on here who were first diagnosed and they probably were told, oh, you're gonna be dead in six to nine months, you should get your affairs in order, right? And because I've heard this from many, many patients and it's terrifying, I, I got it, it's terrifying. And so you're just focused on how do I not die? But then as things kind of go on and you meet new people and new doctors and new nurses and you meet maybe hopefully a net specialist and all those kinds of things and you start to kind of figure things out, all of a sudden it's not about not dying from the disease. Now you have to think about, well, how do I live life with this disease? Okay, And that's kind of where we're going to hopefully chat a little bit about. And I'm not sure I have all the answers. I, I certainly don't have all the answers, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're very blessed. Lisa Yen is also, a, in addition to being an MP, is also a life coach. So she can probably help us with a lot of these things. Um, but it's but it's important because that's what we're really trying to achieve. So like I told you, right, remember there's our two friends here, right? And you can see they are running hard. And when I watch my little guy in the bottom, I'm a little envious because I don't think I can run that fast. I usually exercise about the pace of our guy up front. But the question is, where are they running to? Where are they trying to get, right? Well, unfortunately, this is where they're going, right? This is the disease, right? So, you know, ultimately it's like, whoa, you know, that's what I have to face. And, you know, it, sometimes living your life, you know, knowing that you're dying changes the way you live your life and your priorities and things like that. And so all those are extremely important. But now remember, what we're gonna try to do is put this point as far away as possible, okay? And so it's not that you can't see it and it's not that we don't think about it, right? I mean, you know, to be frankly honest, you know, we don't think about death every day, but then when you get a diagnosis of cancer, it suddenly becomes much more prominent, right? It becomes very real. Although in honesty, we should probably all think about it. I mean, just, just to give you a little context, just over the weekend, um, uh, a young man from who had graduated from the school that my son is going to, uh, he graduated a couple of years ago. He was living in Chicago with a great internship in college. And he was in the train and a stray bullet, a stray bullet struck him in the neck and killed him through the train window. I mean, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. And so, you know, these things happen. So, you know, I'm, I feel blessed, you know, every single day that we have a day to live because you just never know what's going to happen. And so at least with the neuroendocrine portion of it, if you can get some control around the way you feel and think about it, then we can put that point hopefully very, very far away, which is the goal, right? And so there's a lot of stuff that we can do in between. So this is kind of how I think of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, many of you have probably heard me use this analogy before. This is not a perfect picture, but it's a little bit like driving through a you know twelve lane super highway, right? I mean, it's open, it's flat. You can see what's going on. You know, you veer a little bit left or right, you're probably okay, right? And so just that's how neuroendocrine is. So it's a lot of flexibility, which is good, which is good, right? Because it helps us keep you going. And then this is kind of how I think of every other terrible cancer, right? So you're kind of driving right on the edge of the mountain. And if you turn a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, you're gonna fall off the mountain. 
And that's how I feel about a lot of these things. And luckily, I mean, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. You know, we've done amazing things in breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer, and those are getting so, so much better. But it's not the same as neuroendocrine. Neuroendocrine is a much, much more flexible kind of a field. And so we have a lot more room of error, you know, room for error. Whereas most other cancers, we don't have quite as much room for error. So it's a different way of thinking about it. So the goal, as I say, is if I can just kind of keep you going straight, kind of keep you going, you know, ahead, making progress, then we can, then we're doing our job. Okay. And that's kind of what we, we're thinking about. So I, I did tell you I wasn't going to dazzle you with graphs and things like that, but I do want to kind of share this little graph with you, okay? And it's a little bit morbid, so hopefully it's not too, too bad, but I just want to give you a sense of how I think about neuroendocrine and what it is I'm trying to accomplish for you. And then hopefully once you absorb that, then you can in, in appreciate what that means. So let's say the up and down arrow, okay, gives you a sense of how much tumor you have, okay? And this is all very generic, right? Everyone's a little different. Every zebra is different. All the stripes are different. But let's just say this is the amount of tumor you have, okay? Let's say this is the amount of tumor up there in which you will die, okay? And so we are, if you, once you cross that line, then you're not going to make it. Let's say this line is the number of days and years and breaths that heaven has given you on earth. Okay. You know, I don't know how long that is. If you really love bungee jumping, maybe it's going to be a lot shorter. <laughs> if you drink a lot of green tea, apparently, maybe it'll be a lot longer. We'll see. But you get the sense of it. Okay. So that's how the, that's how this graph works. And then as time goes by, okay, as your tumor kind of progresses and grows, if it crosses that red line, then we're in trouble because that means that you've now died of the disease, okay? However, if we can slow things down and your tumors grow a little slower, and they may still grow, but let's say they grow a little slower, okay? And then you have your heart attack or your stroke or whatever it is, you know, then you die with the disease, okay? And those are two very, very different things. So if you die with the disease, then I've done my job, right? If you died of the disease, then that's what we're trying to avoid, okay? So we're trying to go from here, okay? And even if I can slow that down some, and even if you did die of the disease, but you got more time, that would be really great, okay? Even if it was very close to the amount of time you were going to live for other reasons. But obviously, if you died of a heart attack or if you died of a stroke, like I said before, and it wasn't the disease and cancer and neuroendocrine that killed you, then that would be actually what I'm trying to accomplish, right? And so ultimately, if we can keep it way down here so that your tumor burden's not too bad and it doesn't make you suffer too much and then eventually, you know, you know, one dies of natural causes, then that's what we ultimately want. And I know it's horrible to kind of hard and to think about and talk about death, but unfortunately, it is something that's very, very important we need to talk about. And so if you, understanding it does give you a sense of control and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Okay, well, how do I do that, right? How, how do I get that curve to come down? And so I cannot tell you exactly, but I can give you kind of three generic things, which I think are very important. So step one, you always hear me say this, please find a neuroendocrine specialist. I think this is super, super important. I mean, I've said it many times. I wish every neuroendocrine patient would come see me and I'm not the smartest or the most talented, but at least I've done this a lot and I've seen it a lot. And I feel like I have a lot to offer because I figured out a bunch of whole like tricks and ways of helping people. So if you can find a neuroendocrine specialist, because I'm sure you have a wonderful doctor at home, but he or she's not going to see this multiple times every day every day, right? I've already seen like seven patients this morning. You will need a guide. Someone needs to help lead you through this journey. And that's, it's too much to ask of a, of a general oncologist. They take care of brain cancer, bone cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, bladder cancer. I mean, kidney cancer. They take care of all these things. And for them, for to expect them to know a lot about a tiny little unusual cancer like neuroendocrine, is too much to ask for, right? So you need a guide. I mean, look at it. And the, and the journey can be quite perilous, right? It can be scary. I mean, I would never 
in my whole life <laughs> ever climb a mountain like this. But if I did, I certainly wasn't going to do it alone. And if I did, I wasn't certainly not going to do it with someone who doesn't know how to climb Mount Everest. I think this is a, from Mount Everest. So you can see it's really important to have someone who's experienced to help guide you through this. You're going to need the ropes. You're going to need the oxygen. You're going to need the pathway. You're going to need the equipment. So those are the things that are very different for neuroendocrine. So you need a guide through all this. Okay. And you know what? There are lots of them. This is a, a, a great picture I just really love from a, a meeting that the Healing Net Foundation had in San Diego. And you can see there are just a whole, you know, there are do uh, several dozen doctors here uh, who are experienced and know how to help and treat neuroendocrine. And so these are the people who are here to help you. I know it's not easy to get to them. And luckily, actually luckily, now with uh, the pandemic getting better, um, one thing that has been uh, more available has been telemedicine. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do, continue to do telemedicine. But there are a lot of people out there who have a ton of experience and really want to help you and can help you. And so if we can connect you with them and you can find them, you can work with them. These are the people who can kind of get you through this journey. Step two. I think it's really super important to educate yourself. Now, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because you're already logged in or you're watching at some point uh, and you are educating yourself, but it's really important. The knowledge is power. The knowledge is power. The problem is it can be overwhelming sometimes. So you really want to find the right resource that can help you understand your disease. But when you have that education, when you have that knowledge, it does empower you to understand and filter through and figure out what is the best way. Because honestly, if you saw seven neuroendocrine specialists, I would not be surprised if you got three, four, or five different opinions. Because remember, neuroendocrine is a 12-lane superhighway. So if you do a little this or a little this or a little this, then um, you can veer a little bit. And unfortunately, the doctors will also kind of, you know, drift you a little bit. But then you think about what's important, what's happening, how you feel, how does your family feel about it? And then you can come up with a plan, right? And so there are lots of resources. You know, of course, I work with the Healing Net Foundation. They're really great. You just saw the amazing videos and resources LACNETs have. But there's also the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. They have a great uh, lecture se seminar. The NCAN group has, a, has great meetings for um, patient support. The NANETs and the research and the Net Research Foundation are about kind of the scientific aspects of it. And even the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society has a lot of resource too, just information. But it kind of gives you a little bit more context. And it comes from people who do this every single day. And so that's what I really um, want to kind of impress upon you is that having good knowledge gives you the ability to filter through all this information. Again, it doesn't replace having a Sherpa. It does not replace having a person who can guide you through this process. But if you have this knowledge, then you can understand what that path looks like and what that path means. And when you have a fork in the road, you can help decide which way to go based on how you feel. And there are lots of resources. So if you want to come to the Healing Net Foundation, I encourage you to come. We have a couple of really nice resources. There's a book that we wrote with uh, uh, those friends from that picture. It's a primer. It, it says for a primer for healthcare professionals, but it's a primer for anyone. It's a book that kind of describes neuroendocrine in general in very kind of easy way, hopefully digestible uh, language and not you know very, very high level technical information. And just last year, we put, produced another document called Navigating the Net Patient Journey. And we did this in conjunction with our friends here at LACNETS. And you can download these for free. And they're good sources of information about the disease in general, as well as how you are going to live your life with neuroendocrine. This is you. And again, you can see the rows. If we can just kind of keep you going straight, then we're going to be in good shape. And of course, LACNETS itself has a lot of stuff too, but we even collaborated with them and produced the Net Vital program, the, the Net, Net Vital um, uh, piece. And that's all the kind of important information that can help your physician and any healthcare professional when it comes to um, taking care of you. This is all very important information. 
And this was a terrific collaboration. You know, we had kind of brought it up at one of our meetings and LACNET just went and took it over and they've, they've done such a great job with it. And so we're so proud of the collaboration and, and partnership we have with LACNETs. And so there are a lot of resources as well too, even on our, and these are just the ones I know about and that I worked on. So I'm sure there's much more than this, but we have a lot of lectures from really distinguished physicians uh, talking about different elements of neuroendocrine. So if you would like to watch, or if you know of any healthcare professionals who would like to join our boot camp, you can learn a lot about neuroendocrine um, just right over the web. And so there's a terrific amount of information out there. And apparently I have a bunch of YouTube videos too. So if you want to go to YouTube and YouTube me, hopefully there's a, a, a couple things that, that I can show you. Now, step three. So I think this is very important because you can't do this alone, right? I think it's very important to find support. And the support comes from many different places. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir again since you're already here. But if you meet anyone else with neuroendocrine or you happen to hear of it or you can talk about it and, and, and bring awareness to our field, this is something that's important. So you can find support, obviously, with your caregivers, right? You know, spouses, family members, that's all extremely important. You know, the family can be there to support you through many things, through your surgery, through your symptoms, uh, even just understanding your disease and explaining it to others. That's extremely helpful. So those, you know, those people who are immediately around you, think about asking them for help sometimes. You know, sometimes when, as a caregiver, I want to be able to help you, and I may not even know how to help you. Sure, I can go to your doctor's appointments, and I can listen, and I can take notes, and all those things are important, but sometimes I just need you to ask for help sometimes. So don't be afraid of that. And I know, you know, everyone's situation is different. And, and, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, everyone's family is going to be their, their core caregivers. But, you know, it's important for you to know that sometimes you can ask for help. There are friends who, you know, always want to help as well, too. But social media actually has a lot of, you know, despite, you know, all the things that are going on with social media, um, at least in our little neuroendocrine world, can provide some support and some education, some information for people. So you may be able to find some support there. Of course, the local support group, just like uh, LACNETS, which is kind of national now, but is a, is a local support group where you can find people around you who are going through the same things you're going through. Maybe they can recommend uh, physicians. Maybe they can recommend uh, different, different ways of taking medicine. Maybe they can recommend ways to navigate the financial aspects of it. You know, if someone has already gone through it, then maybe they could help you and we can, you guys can talk. There are national support groups like the um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Awareness Network. They have a national meeting, in fact. And so lots of people can get together. They're having one, I think, in Atlanta this year. And so you can get together and talk and meet and just realize that you're not the only person in the country, in the world, with this disease. Of course, your healthcare team, right? Of course, it's most important to have your healthcare team. And hopefully that healthcare team includes, of course, you, your caregivers, but also your local oncologist, hopefully a neuroendocrine specialist, and of course, the nurses and staff that help you with your day-to-day -day, uh, management of your disease. Now, don't forget, emotional and mental health is extremely important. I mean, we can talk about that when we when Lisa comes on too. She's a real expert on that. But you are allowed to not feel great about having this. I know it stinks. I know it does. And so, understanding how important the emotions are, uh, and giving yourself a little space and a little buffer to have those feelings are important. But once you kind of start to understand it then it gives you the ability and the power to control it, hopefully. And once you control it, then you can see how it fits in with the rest of your life and the life that hopefully you want to live. And a lot of it is mental health. And of course, I mean, I know this is so obvious, but it's about comfort too. You need to feel comfortable with what's going on. You need to be comfortable with your diagnosis. You need to be comfortable with the team taking care of you. You need to be comfortable with the treatment. You need to be comfortable with the symptoms that you have and how we can take care of them and improve them, make them better and finding solutions. Sure, you can probably live with having eight rounds of diarrhea a day, but that's not super fun, 
right? And so if we can find a way to make that more comfortable and make you better, then we should do that. And we should talk about that. So everything is important. And I know doctors are rushing through and things are complicated. And I, I, I know, I believe me, I completely understand. But these are important things for you, right? And if, I, and if it just takes a little bit of medicine or a little adjustment of your drugs or maybe some kind of procedure or whatever it is, then we should do that for you. So always feel empowered to talk to your healthcare professional about what's going on. Because if you don't tell me, I won't know. And there's a fair chance that if there is something you tell me, I may be able to fix it. I may not, I may not. But if I can fix it, I want to be able to offer that to you and see if we have a solution for you. Now, I do want to say one important thing these concepts generally don't actually apply to high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. As you know, neuroendocrine is a spectrum. You've probably heard me say this a, a zillion times. It's a, very, it's a class of diseases, a family of diseases, not so much a single disease. And so low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, even you know, modest-grade neuroendocrine tumors, th this is where the living, uh, the marathon is important. But high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma is like driving on the edge of the mountain cliff. And so that's a little bit of a different beast. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands that today. So how do you heal and how do you live with neuroendocrine, right? I, I do not have all the answers to this. I can certainly help, but I don't have all the answers. But at least I have some thoughts about it, which I want to share with you. A lot of it has to, I showed this slide the last time I actually gave a, a LACNETS talk. It's really, I, I love this slide. And I say this because the sequencing of neuroendocrine, you know, when we think about cancer, we talk about sequencing all the time, pathways and things like that. And that really has to do with like the treatments that we're going to give you. How, what sequence are we going to give it to you? And so if you have breast cancer, usually you have your mammogram, then you have your cert biopsy, then you have your surgery, then you have your radiation therapy, then you have your you know, chemotherapy, then you have your hormone therapy, and that's kind of how it goes. So it's a straight line. Neuroendocrine doesn't work that way. Neuroendocrine is a web, okay? And so there are many, many different pathways that we can take. You can turn left, you can turn right, you know? And so when people start to say, well, what about this and what about this? I'm like, hold on one second, okay? I don't know what's going to happen. And the options and possibilities are very, very wide. So it's very difficult. And therefore, I cannot tell you what step one, step two, step three, step four, and step five are because we're going to have to do whatever needs to be done for you. So I think of neuroendocrine more as kind of not a sequencing in a line, but more as, I hope this doesn't sound too childish, but it's more like whack-a-mole, right? So it's like you, you have this issue, you have this problem, you have this tumor, you have this whatever's going on. So you find the problem, you identify it, you work on it, you see how that goes. And then you, if something else comes up, you try again, you keep them on some maintenance therapy. And as if, if you develop blockage, if you develop bleeding, if you have tumors that grow in your liver, if you have something that comes up, you have pain from your bone, any of these things that they come up, you take care of them as they come along. So rather than it being a straight path of what to do, it is more of a web and you just kind of get your hammer out and you whack the moles as the problem comes along. And that's how it is. And the reason too is because neuroendocrine is different. Neuroendocrine, even, you know, we talk about the different zebras, you know, each of you is a different zebra and each of you is very different. Well, it turns out each of the tumors within your body is also different. So they will behave differently. So I will think about one tumor differently than I'll think about another tumor. And so this whack-a-mole analogy really applies to the whole system and the whole disease. So think of it that way a little bit. Okay, so each case is very different. That's obvious, right? And so kind of the analogy I use, and people who know me know I, know I talk in analogies a lot. It's a little like Baskin Robbins, right? So there was a day when there were only 31 flavors in Baskin Robbins when I was a boy. And now I think there are like 170 <laughs> flavors of Baskin Robbins. But that's how neuroendocrine is, right? There are lots of different flavors of neuroendocrine. And if you come up to Colorado, we welcome you to come. If you come up, there's always the cannabis flavor, which is over on the right side. And then right next to it is the Cheeto flavor. So you can always have your little snacks and stuff like that. But that's what it is.
everyone is different. Everyone's different. Okay, so now how do you approach it? Well, I tell people all the time because they will sit here with me and we'll talk for an hour and we'll just kind of go through things and I want to make sure they understand what's happening. But they'll ask, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And I say, hold on one second, okay? Do not put the cart in front of the horse because you don't know what's going on. I can tell you all of the options in the, on the web of treatments of neuroendocrine, but I don't know which path we're going to take because I don't know what's going to happen. And so I can, you know, we can sit together and we can figure things out and we can probably make a decision in just a few minutes, right? Um, but then to have to talk about every single option just makes you crazy. And so when I say, it's okay. What you really want to do is you want to take one step at a time. That means you get a piece of information and then you decide, make a decision based on it, right? So that's what you want to do. So the, always the first question I ask is, well, how do you feel, right? That's the most important thing. As Lisa told you, I'm a huge proponent of quality of life, right? If you get hit, we, we had a person who was hit by a bus on the street outside my neighborhood just a, a few days ago. So you just never know, right, when, that, when, when your time is up. But if your time is going to be on this earth, is good. if you're going to have time on this earth, I want to do everything I can to help you feel better, right? So let's say you're having a lot of flushing. It's very uncomfortable, like our, our door friend here. Well, then maybe you just need good old-fashioned uh, shots, right? Either the hormone suppressive shots like either octreotide or lanreotide. Well, what if you're having diarrhea all the time and you feel really terrible from that? Or you're having abdominal pain? Well, maybe you need the shots, but maybe you need some pills and medicine like telotrostats or Mello to help with your diarrhea or good old Imodium or Lomodal or all the various things we have. So we have a lot of options. And so if I can get you feeling better, then at least I've gotten halfway there. Okay. And that's kind of the first conversation we have to have. How do you feel? Are you having abdominal pain? Are you having obstructions? Are you having excessive hormone production? Are you having this flushing? Are you having this diarrhea? Are you having any other issues? Are you having sugar issues? Those are the kinds of things we want to work on. And even, you know, for the one, uh, for those of you who have come to see me, you know, I always worry about your fatigue. Everyone worries about fatigue. I mean, everyone complains of fatigue and it worries me a lot. And so we always start do we talk about sleep? Do we talk about nutrition? Do we talk about, you know, the social um, kind of uh, surroundings you have? And so those are all very, very important points when it comes to helping your quality of life, because I always want to help that. I can't, I don't know if I can always totally fix your quantity of life, but as best I can, I'm going to try to fix your quality of life. So I also tell people it's not one thing you do want to know is you want to know what's going on. You want to know what's happening. What that means is you want to get a very accurate picture of your disease. So just to kind of explain. When I, as Lisa told you, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the first one to ever do gallium dotatate PET CT, right? So that's 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 my con contribution. We brought it here to the to America. And um, when I first started doing gallium scans, I did not realize how kind of poor the old images were. And so it, I realized that, wow, there's probably so much about this disease I just don't know because I can't see it. But when I had this new tool, which luckily now everyone has, so hopefully you've all had a, 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 some kind of dotatate PET CT, it really tells you what's happening. And that's important for me because I've heard people say, well, why does it matter? Why do you need to know about those lesions in their bone? And why does that matter? Well, it's a big deal. Let's say you had a doctor who wanted to remove half your pancreas. Okay. And they said, oh, we're going to do this operation and we'll remove your tumor and then you'll be f cured. Okay? I've heard this before. I've heard this before. And then you get your gallium scan and it turns out you have a lesion in your liver and you have a couple lesions in your bone, which are not deadly, not going to kill you. But then you didn't have to go through, perhaps, you didn't have to go through the risk and perhaps the complications of a very complicated pancreas operation. So that's why it's so important to know what happens, okay? And then after you kind of get along through your process, you're going to have a bunch of scans. And I got it. Scanxiety is real super real, right? I mean, I do this multiple times a day. And the first thing I do is I walk in and say, Hey, how are you? By the way, your scans are fine. Okay. So like I immediately try to get 
that ski anxiety out of the way so you can take a deep breath and we can have a meaningful conversation. Or if they're not, then we talk about it. But I understand that ski anxiety is real because you can, you just never know every little twinge. You know, it's when is that, when is this, the, this beast going to raise its ugly head again, right? Things have been going great, but gosh, you just never know. And that is the anxiety I know you live with every single day. And so this is how I want to help you with that. But remember, the information that you get is very, very important, okay? Because without accurate information, you can't make a plan. With accurate information, you can now make a good plan that now empowers you, okay? And that's what we're trying to do. Always, it's about empowerment and understanding what you're doing so that you can improve your quality of life and your quantity of life. Yes, if you have that scan, it is terrifying. I remember the very first moment I saw this picture in my career. However, it, it saved this person more surgery, which was what their plans were, poor, more poor scans, which weren't helping at all, and hopefully getting, you know, getting him to the right treatment. So that's what we want. I know it's anxious. I know it's horrible. I know it's terrifying. But you need that accurate information to get the best plan. Okay, so what I say too, don't put the cart in front of the horse. You get a piece of information and then you decide. So for example, if someone has a, this is a, a gallium dotatate scan in the upper left-hand corner. All those little dots are tumors, okay? He was actually quite healthy and quite well. But clearly surgery was not the way to help this person, which is what they were planning to do. So instead, he went and got his PRRT. And honestly, it took me like 30 seconds to look at the picture, decide what to do, and tell him. Right? It wasn't really that complicated. However, if we didn't have the right information, then how would I decide anything, right? Or how about the bottom left-hand corner? You can see there, that's a CAT scan, and right in the middle there is a tumor, right? And that tumor causes some abdominal pain. You know, it's, you know, patients has been, has been having stomach issues for, you know, 10, 20 years, however long it's been. It's because there is an acorn, well, not an acorn, but you know, whatever, an orange or tennis ball where it doesn't belong. So that person needs surgery. So you take, do the surgery, remove that piece of tumor, and hopefully they recover and they feel better, right? But again, when you get the right information, then you decide, right? It's not worth trying to fantasize about what could possibly happen without having the information. So I say, just don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Don't put the cart in front of the horse. When the time comes, I will tell you what needs to be done and I'll explain what it involves. And so that's kind of how I want people to think, because I'd rather you spend the day thinking about, well, what am I having for dinner tonight? You know, when am I going to see my kids at their baseball game? Uh, you know, can I go hang out with the grandkids? You know, now that the pandemic is better, obviously, can I travel? Can I go on vacation? Those are the things I want you to think about, right? It's my job to think about all the other stuff and to help you with that. So, you know, on the one hand, neuroendocrine stinks, right? It is hard to cure. It is frequently metastatic. It often, you know, spreads. It often comes back. So even when you do amazing surgery and it looks great, it does come back. Neuroendocrine can make you feel pretty rotten. I have had a patient who since unfortunately passed and he said the problem with disease, it doesn't kill you that fast, but it slowly robs you of all the things you love in life. And that's true. And we need to work on that. And of course, unfortunately, as you all probably know, not that many healthcare professionals know a whole lot about neuroendocrine. Now we are trying to change that obviously. And we're, you know, slowly, 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 we're getting there, but it's not easy. But on the other hand, neuroendocrine is something that we can manage, right? So, you know, if you wanna think of it more like diabetes or hypertension or stuff like that, then it's something that you can kind of hopefully take care of. Again, not the high grade version, but the low grade version, the neuroendocrine tumors can be very slow growing. Okay. Luckily for neuroendocrine, we have lots of treatment options. And honestly, a lot of neuroendocrine symptoms can be helped. As long as you tell us about it, we can kind of work on it. There's some ability, hopefully, and some room to improve the way you feel. And so if I can improve the way you feel every single day that you are here with the, on earth, then this is 
my goal and this is what I'm going to try to do. So again, I'm not, again, I'm not going to dazzle you with this graph, but what I can tell you is it's always easier to keep you healthy than to dig you out of the ditch when you start to feel sick. Okay, so you can see here on the left of the graph, up is feeling pretty good, low is feeling pretty bad. Okay, and it is much, much easier for me to keep you up here, hopefully, right? Good quality of life, keep you there, than for it to start to collapse, which is what happens with norepinephrine. People just collapse at, at some certain point for various reasons. And that can be from malnutrition, it can be from pain, it can be from the carcinoid heart disease that comes from the hormones, it can come from severe dehydration from all that diarrhea. It can be severe weakness because you've lost so much muscle mass, which is related to the malnutrition. It can be severe fatigue, right? I'm sure this is something you all have felt. But it is hard because sometimes maybe I can stabilize you for a little bit and kind of keep things going and extend the time that you have and make sure you're not feeling so horrible. But then usually it becomes more and more complicated. And, you know, people still die of neuroendocrine. Despite the fact, as Lisa said, people used to think this was a benign disease or it was, you know, cancer-like. It is not. People do die of neuroendocrine. And as much as I wish I could save every single person, I cannot. And so my goal is to make it better, make it better. So if we can go back and keep you healthy, which is really the goal with some surgery and some treatments, you'd be like, I feel fine. Okay, that's good. But I got to keep you that way. And the way we do that is you see your healthcare professionals. You follow the treatments, you eat well, you exercise, you sleep well, and more important than anything else, you enjoy the time, right? The greatest gift we have is the time with our loved ones, the time with the things we love to do, the times with, you know, just being outside and enjoying nature. Those are the things that we are always trying to achieve. And if we can accomplish that, then, we, then we've done our job. So if you don't mind, I just make a little bit of plug. Everyone knows how amazing Lachnitz is, but we also work closely uh, with a foundation that we created called the Healing Net Foundation. And we call it the Healing Net because we know that we can't always cure you or even promise to cure you, but if we can heal you, that's what we want to do. And it's a, it's a, it is a foundation that's dedicated to spreading the word, creating awareness, spreading education, telling stories about patients. And we try to bring professionals together where we can share ideas and work together as a team rather than fighting each other and seeing each other as competitors. But there's a lot of information. So please feel free to download the Neuroendocrine Primer, kind of get you going about the information about Neuroendocrine. This is our team, Cindy, me, and Margaret. And um, I just wanted to show this little video. I hope it shows. But this is a, a very famous musician named Trey Anastasio. And, but his sister actually died of neuroendocrine. And so there are, the face of neuroendocrine is a lot of people. And these are a lot of wonderful people that we've taken care of and some we've lost, unfortunately. And so the more that we can, the more that we can spread awareness and, and knowing that neuroendocrine is an, an unusual disease, but it affects people of all walks of life in all places and all relationships. And unfortunately, the number of cases of neuroendocrine is going up and so we do have a neuroendocrine awareness day, which you all probably know about. And, uh, you know, as long as we can spread the word and help people, that's really what we're always going to try to do. And so through LACNETS and through Healing Net Foundation, hopefully we can do those things. Well, that's it. That's all the slides I have. These are all my friends who are fighting every day to help you. And of course, Lisa and the team here at LACNETS is uh, in that fight as well. So that's all I have, Lisa. So if you want to start the question and answer session, that would be great. Thank you, Dr. Liu. That was an excellent presentation as always. Um, we always love hearing from you and love your holistic perspective on the patient, on the person living with the disease. I, I refrain from saying patient, right? Right, Because we are people um, or, you know, maybe not me, but my husband, right? As you know, this is right. personal. So we're people who are living with the disease and hopefully thriving with the disease. So thank you for that perspective. Exactly, okay. exactly, that's the goal. So we have many questions that have trickled in. So I'm going to start with um, one that is just kind of basic concept uh, concept question. So if the tumors are primarily in your liver, would the patient be considered having a liver disease? 
Wow, that's actually super interesting. Okay, so that has to do with semantics and words and definitions, okay? So when we think of liver disease, that more has to do with the function of the liver. So the liver does a lot of magical things. It's, it is truly an incredible organ. It helps clean your blood. It helps make proteins. It helps uh, uh, make nutrients. It helps, does, it, does all the, it helps process the food that you eat. All these things are very, very complicated processes. But the interesting thing about neuroendocrine, which is different, say, from like cirrhosis from alcoholism or hepatitis or something like that, is that most of the time the liver functions extremely well. So that means the lab tests look good, the protein levels look good, the clotting factors look good. All those things actually come from the health of the liver. And most people have very healthy livers. The problem is there are these t little tumors inside them. And so the analogy I use, it's a little bit like, you know, when we were young, I'm sure you guys remember when they used to sell Jell-O in the grocery store, right? And they would sell Jell-O and they would put little pieces of fruit inside of it, okay? Well, if you dug out all the fruit, the Jell-O wouldn't look beautiful, but it would still be very, very good. And that's kind of how it works for neuroendocrine and liver. So when, when people have tumors in their liver, they do not have liver disease. They actually have a usually a very good functioning liver. I mean, assuming they don't have some other liver disease. But if it's just from the tumors, then their liver is quite healthy. Thank you for clarifying that. I know that comes up um, quite frequently. And a somewhat related question, you know, you talk about enjoying life and, and such. So for a low grade, low volume tumor patient, is it okay to drink moderate amounts of alcohol? For example, one beer a day. Well, I mean, that's hard to say, right? Because the most important thing is you talk to your, your physician about it. So I, don't, I cannot tell you. However, what I can tell you in general, very generically, is I always tell people, if you're going to drink alcohol and you have neuroendocrine, please make it very expensive alcohol. So at least the quality is good. <laughs> I'm teasing. What that really means is, yes, it's probably okay. If your liver function tests are good and you're feeling well and you're, the burden of disease in your abdomen is very, very low, I mean, your liver is very low, then you're probably going to be okay. One beer a day is probably not going to hurt you. But again, that's speaking very generically. And so you may need to speak to your healthcare provider about that. Thank you for that and for clarifying that. And of course, you know, there are, it's, it's always important to talk to our healthcare provider. Um, so the next question, you know, you talk a lot about this being a marathon. We loved your little graphic with the turtle, the tortoise versus the hare. Um, being that it's a marathon, must I, or, you know, any other patient, um, person living with the disease, must I worry about long-term radiation exposure from CT scans that happen every month, every three months? Um, yeah, or in other words, actually... Yeah, this question actually came up twice. Um, what's your thoughts about radiation limits when people receive this, the scans? Yeah, yeah, months? yeah, yeah. I completely understand. It comes up a lot. So if, so if you were getting scans every three months and you're nine years old, I would be super worried about that, right? Because the long-term consequences are actually much more of a problem. However, most of our 50, 60, 70, 80-year-old kind of patients, um, it's usually not a problem because the long-term consequences are really quite long-term and very, very far away. And so once you've kind of gotten through, you know, three quarters of the, your lifespan, you know, that extra 20, the 25% is probably not going to be that bad. The real question is, do you really need a CAT scan every three months or can you use other modalities to kind of take a look? Luckily, our CAT scans have gotten very good. They don't use a ton of radiation anymore. The pictures are extremely good and they're extremely fast. So if there's a health benefit to getting the CT scan every three months, then of course you should probably get it. If there isn't a health benefit, then you can kind of think about it and maybe it, can you do it every six months, right? That would cut it in half. But then again, some people need a CT scan every three months because they have very aggressive disease. And then, then we're talking about something totally different. So if you have an aggressive disease, forget the radiation. That doesn't have anything to do with anything. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and as you mentioned, we had a conference last month and Dr. Tom Hope, who you know well, did a, a presentation on um, radiation safety with PRT, but also covers radiation safety in general. So um, for, re for our audience out there, I would check that out as well.
Yeah, that's um, that's a good topic Lisa, because because actually just to give you some context, so if you if you have PRT, that's like standing in the middle of a hurricane when it comes to the amount of radiation you get. Whereas if you have an X-ray or a CT scan, that's like having you know a a, a, a summer rainstorm. You know, it's it's just, it's not the same thing. So it gives you a sense of of the the wide spectrum of amount of radiation you would receive. Thank you for that. And um, since you, you know, are very familiar with the gallium 68 scan, um, this question also comes up quite frequently. Is there a correlation between the X SUV max that we see on those scans and treatment responses like to uh, My guess is also they're asking about PRT or other treatments. Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. And I cannot tell you exactly. There have been some studies that have looked at this SUV max. In general, the the principle, the concept is, if your SUV max goes up, that means that you have more cells and it's more active. If your SUV max goes down, so let me explain SUV first, let me so everyone understands. So SUV stands for standardized uptake value. That's basically when you look at a gallium or a dotatate scan, we, you know, we have a copper now, copper scan. So any kind of dotatate scan, it's kind of how dark and how much the tumors glow, okay? It gives you a sense. Now, it's not perfectly correlated, right? Because no one dies from an SUV, right? So if the, if the tumors don't grow, if they're not causing any problems, then it's probably not a big deal. However, we do have some, some interesting information that suggests that if the SUV max goes down from your octreotide, which is not usual, actually, just to be frankly honest, but mostly from the PRT or some chemotherapy or whatever it is, then that can certainly help a, a lot and it may be indicative of a response to the treatment so that we do have some colleagues especially in Europe who feel like if you have PRT and the brightness and the glowiness of your tumors goes down then that's a successful treatment even if the tumor doesn't shrink thank you for that um, that's really helpful and that does come up quite a bit um, I'm glad you mentioned copper 64 because there was a question on on that, um, but before we get to that, um, since you're talking about glowing and such, so if if those receptors aren't found and there isn't that glowing on the dotatate scan, does it mean that they won't be found anymore, or is it worth it to have another dotatate scan? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So usually, if you have tumors and you know the tumors are there, and you have a dotatate scan and it is stone cold negative then you have a variety of neuroendocrine, unfortunately, that doesn't have the receptor. So it's a little bit like having, being, having hair or not having, or being bald, right? It's kind of that thing. So luckily, luckily, most of our neuroendocrine tumors have the receptor, they have hair. But a few of them are bald. And actually, the, actually about 50-50, I can't tell you exactly, but about 50-50 of the lung neuroendocrine tumors are bald. They don't have the receptor. So that means we can't do it. So if, if you do have tumors and you get a dotate scan and it's negative, then it's probably not super helpful to have future dotate scans. The problem comes is when you have, did not get a scan, have surgery, and then get a scan, then you don't know for sure because I don't know if you had any tumor inside your body when you had the scan done. So that's why, you know, you may have heard me say this before, you always want to get your workup done totally and completely before you have your surgery. Okay, so you want to get all the imaging and all the tests done before you rush off to operation, which unfortunately, you know, a lot of surgeons are very eager to get inside there. And so sometimes we, you know, we unfortunately um, skip some steps. And so that's not great. Um, so the really the goal that Dotatate scans to determine if you have receptor and if future dotatate scans and maybe even future therapeutics like Lutathera or you know whatever PRT is available might be an option for you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and you mentioned copper 64. So now that it is um, kind of coming out, if it is available at my local institution, should I get this scan or should I get a gallium 68 scan? Well, you know, so the copper 64 and the gallium 68 are very, very close. They are a little bit different. I'm not gonna lie to you. But most of it is actually uh, logistical differences on, our, on the back end for us. So the pictures are almost exactly the same. They're not exactly, but they're almost exactly the same. And, uh, but the copper 64 is much easier to handle and to deliver and stuff like that. So a lot of it has to do with what your institution has. And so if you can get 
copper 64, it's fine. If you get a gallium 68, that's fine too. Just understand that they will be ever so slightly different when you look at them on the screen. And so it might help to have your physician kind of walk you through it and look at the picture so they can interpret it more carefully for you. Thank you for that. Um, so let's get to some other questions about biomarkers and such. Um, so why might pancreatin levels be elevated when other tests such as chromogranulin A, serotonin, and 5-HIAA are normal? Well, pancreatin is a really super interesting hormone. Um, it's a breakdown product of chromogranin A. In fact, is you know kind of championed by a, a, a laboratory in Los Angeles called InterScience Institute. Um, and pancreatin seems to be a little bit more resilient kind of to the various things that uh, occur with chromogranin. So now it just becomes a little bit in the weeds, right? Unfortunately, chromogranin A, there are like six or seven different tests for it now. The tests are very, very different. The quality of it is just not so great. Serotonin is challenging because it varies a lot even in the course of a day. And 5-HIAA, you, you know, your body may not, your tumors may not make 5-HIAA. So we think that pancreastatin might be a little bit more of a durable test to kind of give us a sense of, of you know, how much tumor burden you have. But again, lab, so you, you've heard me say this before, Lisa, I don't love lab tests and lab markers. They give me certain elements of information, but most of the time they just kind of freak people out. And so you, you have to understand how to use them, what they mean, and how you're going to uh, you know, change your decision making based on those levels. But they're a small, for me anyway, they're a small portion of how I decide what to do. The much more important thing is how do you feel and what your scans show. Yeah. You always look at the whole person and not just a number. Always. Thanks for doing right? that. I'm treating a person. I'm not treating a number. Yeah. No one dies of a lab value. <laughs> you always told me that. Yeah. You're treating a person, not a number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, another follow-up question. When they, so when the lab tests serotonin and chromogranin, can certain foods cause a false positive or elevated levels? Should patients fast before drawing blood? So I, you know, again, you know, I don't love lab tests, so I, I can, I, I'll just tell you how I feel about it. So in general for chromogranin, it's not related to food. The classic one is the serotonin and the 5-HIAA. Those are classic. It's not 100%, but those are the classic ones. So walnuts, avocados, pineapples, chocolate, you know, the whole list of serotonin can certainly affect those lab values. Chromogranin is usually not affected by food. It is much, much more affected by medications. So and any of your proton pump inhibitors, Nexium, Prilosec, you know, Protonix, you know, any of those things will falsely elevate your chromogranin. So it becomes a test you can no longer use. And since pretty much everyone is taking some kind of PPI nowadays, it becomes difficult to, to kind of filter through. So I don't go crazy about any of these things, knowing that all of these lab values are taken with a grain of salt. Thank you for that. Um, this question also comes up quite frequently. Why do some doctors use CT and some use MRI? This I can explain to you very clearly. Um, it probably just has to do with convenience and comfort and maybe not understanding the differences between the two, to be frankly honest. And I don't, I don't want to sound, um, I don't want to sound like a know-it-all. However, however, a, a lot of the uh, medical physicians aren't always aware of the subtle differences in the imaging and radiology. And so for me, for example, right, I'm, I'm a surgeon, right? So I do this for a living. So I look at all the images like and study them myself. And I always look at what the radiologist said to help me, but I always look at the pictures. But many, many medical doctors who aren't trained in how to read these scans don't look at the scans. They just read the report. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, a picture is worth a thousand words. And the average MRI has a thousand images, okay? So there are not a million words in that report, so you don't always get that information. Okay, so that's imaging in general. So the reason most doctors use CT because it's fast, it's cheap, it's very, very standardized, and most people can just read it very clearly. And the CT is very good for certain things. It's very good in the lung. It's very, very good in the bowel. Okay, and it's pretty good in the pancreas. However, uh, it is not so awesome in the liver, and it's because the contrast it, timing is, is a problem, and it's not so great in the bone. Okay, it's, it's good, it's not great. Okay, so then an MRI is the end all be all 
if it's a good MRI machine for the liver, right? It is much, much more accurate and it's very, very, very sensitive, right? I've seen many, many times where you can pick up like 20 to 50 to, you know, 10 times more of the small lesions on the MRI. So that's very good for the liver. It's very good for the bone. And then ultimately the gallium or copper dota tape PET CTs are good for kind of assessing all of your disease. The only problem is the, um, the um, detail is not so great because sometimes they glow a little bit. So you can't always tell perfectly the size. So, so that resolution is a little bit kind of different. So you need all of these scans. You need to understand why you're getting it. You understand what information you're going to get from it and how you're going to use it. They all look um, at the person in a different way. Correct. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we kind of were talking a little bit about radiation safety and such. So it, this question came up as a follow-up. Where does dotatate st stand between CT and PRT for radiation? Well, so a standard dotatate, gallium dotatate PET CT has actually less radiation than a high-resolution CT scan. And then, so, you know, if here's the dotatate scan, here's the CT scan, they're, they're pretty close. And then PRT is like this. I mean, PRT is like, like off the screen. So they, they don't compare at all, at all. Okay. Thank you for that. So there are several questions that come up in your field about um, surgery. So um, let's get to those. Um, as a surgeon, what's your decision process on whether the surgery will be done laparoscopically or open abdominal? And what factors influence your decision? Well, for me, it depends on safety. It always depends on safety. So if I can do an operation safely laparoscopically, then I'm going to do that, okay? Uh, because you can usually heal faster, the incisions are smaller and stuff like that. However, if I need to use my hands and get inside there and I need to be able to see and expose because I can do the operation more safely, then I'm going to do that. Let me just give you an example. And so I can't really tell you, right? Because everyone's so different. I have to really study it and think about it, which is why a lot of people ask a lot of advice of me over the internet. And I just can't do that because I need to study your case. So it's not that I don't want to help you over the internet. I just can't do it. Okay. Um, so anyway, so a very good example is like if you're going to do a very complicated uh, pancreas resection or a liver resection, right? And it's true. There are probably some like amazing surgeons who can do it laparoscopically. Uh, and I just can't do it. You know, I just can't do it. However, I've also been in situations in which the doctor said, oh, yeah, we can do this laparoscopically. And then it takes them 15 hours to do an operation that we could have done in three. So, you know, there's kind of weighing those, those kinds of things. And so I, I think about that very hard. And as much as I can do laparoscopically, I will. But if I can do it safer and, you know, more effectively open, then I'm going to offer that as a better option. Safe and more effective sounds like a good plan. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this question has come up a couple times as well. How much control does a patient have on the extent of his or her surgery? Can he or she require that a certain part of his or her body um, not be removed? Yeah, the answer is of course, right? I mean, that the answer, well, okay. The answer should be yes, right? Quite clearly, it should be yes. Have, have I heard horror stories? Yes, I've also heard horror stories too. But this is the kind of situation where you want to have a relationship with that surgeon that you feel comfortable with and you can tell them why you feel a certain way and know that you feel comfortable with it. But that also if they decide to go with plan B or plan C, that there, it was for a very good reason. So this question is actually more about communication and a relationship than anything else. So yes, you can say you do not remove my pancreas, period, period. And if they don't, if they don't heed what you said, that's a huge problem. That's a huge, huge problem. So I, I, I can't answer that because I don't think I've ever been in that situation. However, I've told people to, you know, if you want to keep your gallbladder, you can certainly keep your gallbladder. But these are the issues and these are the complications and this is what might happen in the future. So just understand that's the situation. And usually once I explain things, they understand what the situation is. And then also if I tell them about, you know, sometimes I don't know what I'm going to find and I may have to do a little bit more then they understand that as well. So again, it's really about communication and relationship. But yes, you Thank should you. have control over your own body, yeah. Yeah, the communication piece is important. 
Yeah. Um, so this question also has come up quite frequently, as you know. So should the primary tumor always be removed if possible? The answer is no. So, um, but it's much, much more complicated than that. Uh, there are some, when I first started, actually, when I was in Sweden, one of the doctors was very insistent that primary would be removed every single time, no matter what. And then I had, uh, I have a friend who's a surgeon and he said, yep, you got to remove it every time. It changes the survival of patients. Well, after I started doing this for a long time, then I realized, well, frequently the primary should be removed because it causes problems. Okay. And so in the bowel, for example, in the guts, right? So it can, it can cause a blockage and so it should be removed and you should remove it when the person's healthy, right? And they're doing well Ver versus when they're feeling really, really sick and they're having a lot of problems. So you should get it out when you can, but it doesn't have to be removed today. So what I realized, it wasn't a yes or no question. It was kind of a when question, okay? So you can do it later on, right? Maybe the patient becomes symptomatic or, you know, if they, even if it's for their, for their psychological purposes. Of course, if that's the only disease you have, then yeah, you should probably get it out and, you know, maybe we can keep our fingers crossed and even use the C-U-R-E word, but you don't always know. So that's why, again, all the zebras are different. You have to study the case before you decide and you have to think about it. Thank you for that. Remembering that we're all different zebras with different stripes. Um, so this question is an interesting one. Why would certain people be more prone to post-op compl uh, complications like bowel obstructions after gut surgery? I don't have an answer for you that because that's such a complicated question. The problem is there's so many different possibilities that can occur. Okay. So when you have an operation, one, it can certainly be nobody's fault, right? Complications just happen sometimes, right? So you just never know. One, two, it could be kind of how you are going into the operation. If you're already pretty sick walking in, you may not heal so well. Three, it may have to do with the operation that was performed. Four, it may have to do with the kind of expertise that the, that the physician has with it. So there's just a whole bunch of variables that go into the complications. I'm not perfect. You know, I do surgery all the time and most people, thankfully, right? Thankfully, most people do pretty well, but some people have, you know, some block, some problems. A bowel obstruction, for example, happens because of swelling or maybe a technical issue or, you know, whatever, right? So there are lots of things that can happen. The most important thing is that we can nurse you through it and get you better to the other side. Thank you for that. Um, so this is also another, you know, surgery related question. After an open abdominal surgery for small bowel and liver tumors, is back pain a common side effect of recovery? Um, I'm not sure how to use the word side effect, but it is definitely something that people experience. So there are a couple things that cause a lot of back pain. One is lying in that hospital bed. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's true. Like a lot of people, because the hospital beds are not great for healing, um, people get a lot of back pain from lying in it. The other thing too is depending on kind of like the size of the incision and how much pain you had and how they controlled it and stuff like that, a lot of people will favor their front of their belly and then they won't, they won't even know, but subconsciously will have a, like tightening their back and that will cause that kind of compensation will cause back pain as well. So it's not uncommon. But at the same time, it's the thing you need, you should talk to your physician about. Make sure it's not some other like complication like we just talked about causing back, which is manifesting itself as back pain. Make sure it's not like a urinary tract infection or your kidney infection or something like that, or, or an injury or, you know, who knows? You, you, can, you can certainly have surgery and you can still slip a disc, right? I mean, so anything can happen, but you have to make sure you speak to your healthcare providers about it. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and if you're going to have surgery for non-NETS issues, should the anesthesiologist give you the octreotide before surgery or just have it on hand? Well, that's debatable. Uh, so depending on who you talk to, um, you'll hear different things, right? I told you, you talk to five different neuroendocrine specialists, you'll hear five different stories. I will tell you what I do, just to be very clear. This is just what I do. If the patient, I think, is a, so the, the whole purpose of the octreotide is to avoid something called carcinoid crisis. Okay. Carcinoid crisis is when you have some procedure and it sets off all the hormones and then your blood pressure becomes unstable and your heart rate becomes unstable because of the hormones. Okay. So that's what a carcinoid crisis is. And unfortunately, surgery and things can set it off. Uh, it certainly does happen. It actually is 
I think is actually rarer than we think it is uh, for kind of relatively mild, you know, straightforward procedures, dental procedures, uh, colonoscopies, endoscopies. I've done this, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And most of the time people don't need octreotide. But every now and then people do. And so um, usually what we have with someone who's potentially very, very vasoactive, so, you know, potentially high risk for carcinoid crisis, we will give them some octreotide as a shot beforehand and the anesthesiologist will hold it on hand. But even when I do a big operation, I actually, so this is just me. This is my practice. I don't give it beforehand. We have it on hand, always prepared during the anesthesia and we watch. And if the patient's not doing great, then we, then we give the octreotide and then give the other medicines that help treat the problem. The most common time it happens is when I, when I do surgery and I squeeze on the tumor like a sponge, right? Because I have to kind of grab it sometimes. And then it will shoot the hormone out. That does happen. There's no question. But obviously, if you're with an anesthesiologist with experience with such a thing, they will be able to treat you and get you through it without any problems. But in general, in general, most mild, small procedures don't require octreotide. But if you want to have them, and if you want to have it on hand, there's never anything with being prepared. I mean, there's anything wrong with being prepared. Yeah, pre preparation is always helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get to some oh, of what the... That means, but Lisa, but what that means is that you always need to have a conversation with your surgeon and your anesthesiologist, right? It's always about communication. You got to make sure they know about it and are prepared. And you want to tell them beforehand so they have time to prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back to that communication piece for sure. Right. So yeah, with um, with all these questions, there's of course questions about treatment. So let's get to some of those. Um, so for metastatic cases with uh, somatostatin receptors, are the treatment options and responses to treatments better? Well, um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, the one good thing about having the receptor is it tells us two things. One, they tend to be a little bit what we call better differentiated, so well differentiated. So they tend to be a little bit less aggressive than the ones that don't have the receptor. Again, a very general blanket term. And we generally have, because they're slower, we generally have more options for it. When you have very high grade aggressive cancer, chemo is essentially, unfortunately, the only thing we have, and it's not awesome. But with the receptors, you have medicines, you have hormones, you have the PRT, so we have lots of things. Oh, you have surgery, you have embolizations, you have you know, bone treatments, you have a lot of different things that you can do. And so it's not so much that the treatments themselves are better. It's really because the disease is a little bit less aggressive. And so some of the treatments will do work, will work a little bit better. Yeah, thank you for that. So, and speaking of a specific treatment, what are your thoughts about long-term use of CAPTEM? And are there concerns about toxicity if taken, quote unquote, forever? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know the forever portion of it because I've never given it to anyone for forever. So I don't really know. But CAPTEM is an abbreviation for a, a treatment that we typically use for lung and for pancreatic neuronic tumors called capecitabine and temozolomide, the two chemo pills. They work great. They work great. And they work really well for um, the pancreatic neuronic tumors. Uh, the problem is toxicity. And two things that can happen is people can get like this kind of hand and foot kind of thing from the cap. And some people, can, many people, can get bone marrow suppression from the TEM, right? The more common problem is not so much a long-term toxicity. The more common problem is it stops working. So that's usually the thing. So, you know, I've given cap -10 for a couple of years before, and if they tolerate pretty well, maybe we can space out the time between the treatments so they get a little bit more good time between it, but they still get some treatment. It's not perfect. I'm not sure we know exactly what to do. All we know is that the combination works very well. You can frequently get some kind of even a little bit of shrinkage from the tumor. It can, it's pretty good about controlling disease. Not everyone, but it's pretty good about controlling the disease. But usually at some point, the side effects and the um, uh, ineffectiveness are what catch up to you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, again, this, a lot of people are on somatostan analog injections. So what's the average time that they prevent liver tumors from growing? Well, that's, that's hard to, to answer, right? Because we have a couple of trials that have looked at that. And so, so an SSA injection is, is essentially octreotide samsatin or lanreotide somatuline. Okay. And to be frankly honest, they're not super powerful medications. They're good. 
right? They're really good. If you have very slow disease, then they're good at kind of controlling slow disease. If you have really fast disease, they just don't work at all, okay? But they're very tolerable. They have their mild side effects and you get it once a month, right? So the average time for the growth of, of disease, let's say the growth of disease, in, um, oct with octreotide, cyanocyanin, was studied in Germany. And I, I want to say it was about like uh, about a year or so, about a year or so. Uh, whereas with the lanreotide, which is a little bit more complicated because they tested kind of different tumors. And again, I can't tell you specifically for liver because they kind of describe progression in general but was a little bit over a year. So it's a little bit kind of in that range. Now, I wanna say something clear. The somatostatin analog, okay, it, it doesn't usually make tumors shrink. Sometimes it does, but it's, it's pretty unusual, okay? However, it can frequently hold things very stable. But if your disease would normally grow this fast naturally, okay, the somatostatin analogs can slow it down and it may not be perfect, it may not be perfect and still may grow a little bit. So it, there still may be some efficacy. And so this is where you need to kind of think about all the different tumors, what they respond to, and how you may want to go after it. Because what if you had, let's say you had 10 tumors and you were on an SSA for a long time and nine tumors continue to be stable and one tumor grew, okay? Does that mean that the SSA is ineffective for those other nine tumors? Whereas that one tumor maybe could be treated a different way. In a clinical trial, they would say that your treatment doesn't work at all. It has stopped working because the one tumor grew. So I think of it as kind of a more of an individualized uh, aspect. And, you know, I maybe not be right. I think a lot of people might disagree with me, except that I see that each of the tumors behaves differently. And that's only come from experience. Mm, thank you for that. So it's, again, case by case. Um, and again, there's there's going to be some questions about you know treatment sequencing. So, and I know that you you have you're going to have to review each case. Um, but just in general, is it better to try to reduce the primary tumor, which may be in a difficult area, first through PRT and then have surgery, or surgery first? Yeah, so that's super hard to answer. You're right, Lisa. Right, it's an individual thing. I, I actually have pretty strong feelings about this. When it comes to reducing the burden of the tumor, you're I think if you can do it safely, you're much better off doing it surgically first because you can get all that stuff off. The PRT, and people will disagree with me, but I have found the PRT not to be super great for big tumors. Um, they seem to work quite well for kind of controlling small tumors. And uh, again, people will disagree with me, but this is just what I've seen. And, um, but surgery is really great for getting big tumors out. The PRT is not super great for reducing tumor size, okay? I mean, some people have some reduction. And, you know, some cases, they, it goes away, like, really in a miraculous way. But that's not the common scenario. The common scenario is that it slows the growth or it freezes the growth, right? So if I – and then the other problem, too, is we've seen people who didn't have surgery and then had PRT and had swelling from the radiation, and it caused some complications from it. So the, it's not – perfect. So you have to think very, very hard about how to do this. And I always prefer, if you can, to get it all cleaned out and then to chase it and clean it with PRT at some point. Thank you for that. Thanks. Um, and this is an interesting question more about treatments of symptoms. Is there a reason that tincture of opium is not standard treatment for carcinoid syndrome diarrhea? Well, I don't know. It, it's, it, it is our standard treatment. It's just that tincture of opium is expensive and hard to get. So that's the major problem, but it is part of our, our, our algorithm. So I would actually disagree with the question. I think it actually is standard treatment for carcinoma syndrome diarrhea, but there are other options which are easier to get, right? So if you, you're talking about CSD, certainly your somatostatin analog is, well, treating the tumors is the most important thing. So if you can do surgery or embolization or whatever needs to be done or PRT, but then you also wanna be on a somatostatin analog, right? You also want to give, uh, you know, at least consider giving something like Zermelo Telotrostat, the agent that blocks the serotonin. And then good old Imodium, good old Lamotol, and then, of course, tincture of opium, which is not fun and tastes terrible, but, um, but it's certainly a possibility. And then other medications like periactin and, you know, other of the fancier drugs that help to treat irritable bowel diarrhea as well, too. So we have a lot of things. You can see I just counted off like 10 different things. 
So we have a lot of things that we can do to try to get it under control. It's not perfect, but we try our best. We have a lot of tools. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, this question, of course, comes up a lot. Do you recommend supplements for your patients? Well, I don't usually recommend any specific supplements, uh, except for like something that's very obvious, like someone is flushing a lot and they don't have enough niacin, I mean, something like that. But usually, and I only say because I take them too, um, I think uh, general vitamins are perfectly reasonable. I mean, I, I think people differ on their opinions about these things. I like B-complex vitamins because I think a lot of people don't get enough B vitamins. And I think I take vitamin D as well, too, because I think a lot of people don't get enough sunlight anymore. And so vitamin D is very important. And then beyond that is a little bit beyond my field of expertise. Um, but those kind of three very basic things are, are, are usually things that I might just vaguely recommend to people. Thank you. And a follow-up question to that is, is there anything we can do to lower serotonin naturally? Not that I know of if the serotonin comes from your tumors. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of it has to, so you've, you guys have heard of the five E's before, right? Which, which I have a little bit of beef with, but the five E's are essentially five things that set off uh, like a carcinoid flush or carcinoid symptoms, right? And so syndrome, carcinoid syndrome. So the five E's are ethanol, exercise, emotion, eating, and epinephrine. So the epinephrine one, I, I profoundly disagree with. So let's just forget that. But the other four are things that actually kind of you can control. But I don't know. Can you really control your emotions that much, right? And, you know, of course, you want to think about what you eat because that's going to affect kind of how you feel. Um, and you want to eat healthy, of course. Exercise, look, I'm sorry. I think you should probably get some exercise. I think it's important. Yeah, it may change the way you exercise. And then ethanol, right? You know, you try it. If it sets something off, then you might get it. You might have to cut back. So those are the things that usually kind of trigger the serotonin. But as far as um, lowering the serotonin, actually, I don't know of anything specific. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I know many people with gallium 68 will show tumors in the bones and spine. So if you have tumors in the bones or spine, do you need to be more proactive or just wait? Also, do you need treatment to strengthen the bones to prevent fractures? Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't, I, uh, um, all I will say is I, I disagree with uh, some of my colleagues. So in, so with that caveat, um, neuroendocrine tumors of the bone usually are not um, life-threatening, usually, usually. And they tend to be soft and they tend to be mushy and they tend to be in the bone marrow, okay? So which is different from like prostate cancer and breast cancer where it like breaks the bone. So it, it, the, the risk of fracture is very high in those kinds of cancers. It happens in neuroendocrine, but it's not that common. So usually the side effects of the bone strengthening agents are, are worse than the, than the benefits. And so I kind of shy away from it. But a lot of oncologists give it just routinely. So it's it's not wrong. There's no right or wrong answer for it because I don't have like a, a clinical trial that tells me whether it's right or wrong. Um, but I find that most people do fine, unless they have pain. If they have pain and they're symptomatic from it, then you should be proactive, uh, then you should treat it. It's, I guess it's not being proactive. It's more about just watching your weight because frequently people don't have any symptoms from their bone mats. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, you're a doctor who is just willing to have honest talk with us, talk frankly about death. So this question is, you know, a really honest one. When your tumor burden is too great to live with, what does your death look like? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit morbid, but I think it's important for people to kind of understand. So in general, there are three ways, you may have heard me say this before, so I, I, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but in general, there are three ways that people die of neuroendocrine, in general. One is from overwhelming hormone. Two is from liver failure. And three is from some mechanical issue where there's too much cancer just you know, causing blockages and things like that. So in general, when you have too much hormone, then it can be pretty ugly because uh, let's say you have carcinoid heart disease, right? In which your blood is flowing backwards. And if you don't fix it in time, you die of heart failure you can be very, very swollen and very, very weak and very, very short of breath, and it can be quite horrible. Um, treatable, but not great. Um, if you die of liver failure, that's when your liver becomes totally engulfed with tumors. That can be ugly too, because what happens is you get weaker and weaker. Your belly gets very, very full. It can also, so you can't eat. 
And then your belly fills with a lot of fluid too. And that can be very, very uncomfortable. And then what happens is you start to lose muscle mass and people can develop a lot of swelling, especially in the lower parts of their belly. And then their brain starts not to be so clear anymore. They become very, very foggy and, and they can be confused. They can do very weird things. And then eventually, because they don't eat, they can never, they cannot keep up with their nutrition. Then they start to get weaker and weaker and they die that way. And then the last way is from like a mechanical problem where there's a tumor that's blocking all the blood flow or there's a tumor that's causing, you know, blockages and obstruction or the tumors have tangled up all your, your bowels in such a way that you can't eat anymore. Or that the a tumor from the pancreas, for example, has, has caused it to clog up so much that um, uh, the, the blood flow to be blocked so much that you bleed out from it. Or your lungs have so many tumors, which this is a little unusual, but sometimes uh, the lungs can become so full of tumor that you become short of breath and you just can't breathe anymore. So all of these ways are not awesome, um, which is why it's so important that when you are kind of getting closer and closer, which you know we don't love to talk about, but is, is important to talk about, is to work with your physician, make sure we can find symptomatic relief for you, but then to also work with hospice to know that, to prepare for when the end really comes, that it doesn't have to be suffering. Yeah, thank you for that honest talk. And, you know, I thought this person's uh, statement in question is, is a really a, a good one to end on. Um, so this person in particular met you years ago, soon after they were first diagnosed. And nine years later, it's all kind of blooming, I'm assuming, kind of progressing again. So they're feeling like they're starting at square one. How do they keep positive? Well, it is kind of like starting at square one because things were so good for a long time. Well, there's one thing you should be aware of. So one, you have lived with it for a long time. Two, you now understand it. Three, you've developed a kind of a network of support like LACnets uh, to kind of get you through it. And Seattle has a very nice support group as well too. So those things are, are all important. Now, the question is what to do. You now probably have the resources to go through and kind of figure out what's happening, right? Because you're educated and know what's, what, what's going on. So you want to make sure you know what's happening. You want to know, you know, if, if it's really, quote unquote, blooming, how is it blooming? Is it blooming super fast? Are you still okay? Or how are you feeling? All those kinds of things. So all the things we talked about still apply. It's just, you know, when you get through step three and if you need to go back to step one, go back to step one, two, three. One, two, three. So just keep going through it, go through the algorithm and see uh, where you get. And again, it's all about having the right information, working with a specialist and um, making sure you understand what's happening, making sure you feel well. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm also gonna point out that you, as you mentioned, the navigating that patient journey, see what I have here? Yay. <laughs> this is also a helpful guide. And it talks about some of those things, the unanticipated journey, the coping, palliative care, supporting you um, throughout the journey. Um, you know, all those concepts that we're talking about that's really hard. Um, yeah, we talk about treatments a lot, education, all the like the, the medical informational stuff, but there's all this other stuff that you, you and I have been talking about all throughout this last hour and a half, the communication piece, the support, the emotional well-being and such. So uh, we're all whole people, so we need whole support as well. Right, absolutely. Um, and I just want to see if you have any closing comments as we as we end the session. Well, I want to thank the LACNETS for always being there to support uh, our neuroendocrine community. It is a little bit of a weird disease, you know. There, you know, people think they're all alone with this weird, crazy disease, but it it's there, and more people have it, and there are lots of people out there who want to help you. So, you know, I thank LACNETS for putting this on and developing this the, these um, seminars, and having and building that knowledge so that people know that there is help out there. Thank you. And thank you for being that help in many ways. I mean, both seeing and treating patients with all your work with the Healing Net Foundation, all that you're doing um, in research and, you know, collaboration and, and supporting us and, you know, all the other groups out there. So thank you for all you do. We really appreciate you. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Thanks to you all. Okay. Now back to Rich and Lindsay in the studio. Thank you so much, Lisa and Dr. Liu. As a reminder, be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. Also, as a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and can be viewed on our YouTube channel shortly after the live broadcast. You can find our YouTube channel at bit.ly slash LACNETS YouTube. 
Before I pass it off to Lisa to close us out, I'd like to remind our viewers that these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We have our own opinions and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACMETs. Now off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. We understand these are challenging times and we offer many programs and resources, including our weekly net support group, our monthly net caregiver only support group, Net Vitals, a downloadable patient physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments, and health coaching, available to net patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, take net quizzes to check your understanding of all the information you're learning, and much, much more. We're excited to share the rest of our speakers for 2021. Next month, medical oncologist Dr. Chandrika Chandrasekharan from University of Iowa will be presenting on treatment selection and sequencing in NETS, a very popular topic of conversation in our community. In September, medical oncologist Dr. Robert Ramirez will be joining us from his new home in Vanderbilt University to discuss lung NETS. And in October, we're pleased to have the CEO of the nonprofit Triage Cancer, Joanna Morales, join us to cover navigating health and disability insurance. Again, another very important topic. Our November Net Cancer Day Symposium will focus on patient advocacy with guest speakers, patient advocates, Josh Mailman and Cindy Lovelace, as well as patient physician, Dr. Mark Lewis. And in December, Chaplain Mark Echelon will join us once again to close out the year with an inspirational talk that is titled, Riding the Cancer Wave, Spiritually Speaking. And now back to you, Lindsay. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Eric Liu, for joining us today, and a special thank you to Rich at TVP Live for making today's broadcast possible. We will see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye.